Tantra Illuminated with Dr. Christopher Wallace is a journey through the depths of the human experience. As viewed through the lens of the tradition called Non-Dual Shaiva Tantra. This multi-format podcast delves into the fascinating world of classical Tantra and its intersections with philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, human development, and the broader world of spirituality. Today's episode is a conversation, and I'm speaking with Ishwar Sigobin. I'm particularly excited to share this interview with you all because Ishwar is so far almost unknown to the spiritual communities interested in non-duality and awakening and so on. Perhaps that will soon change as he's getting more and more known. But uh, what's really wonderful about speaking with Ishwar is the freshness that he brings to conversations on this topic because uh, he wasn't steeped in any religious or even spiritual background when his awakening occurred. It wasn't quite out of the blue, but close to it. Uh, he was and still is an electrician in the Philadelphia area who some years ago uh, was dealing with an alcohol addiction that landed him in a recovery house. And it was there that his awakening began. Now, this particular scenario is not so uncommon, but what is very uncommon is that from the moment his awakening process started to the time of its completion was less than a year. And of course, by completion, I, I don't mean to imply some static state, um, you know, or some uh, state where learning more is not possible. No, 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 just that it is possible to reach a point where you are abiding in non-dual selfless awareness most of the time or all of the time. And that's when we consider the process of awakening to be complete, even if there's more to realize or more to integrate. So my experience of Ishwar is he is indeed abiding in awakeness, in non-dual awareness, in selflessness. And uh, it's, it's really wonderful to speak with him uh, because his state of radical freedom just oozes from every word, really. And I have no idea how I got connected with him. It's a, a mystery. <laughs> Somehow it just happened. And we, we, we got on the phone and started talking and uh, it was wonderful, as you'll soon hear. So I'll read just a tiny bit from his bio. Ishwar communicates his journey with stark clarity, discussing how he came to understand the truth as he perceives it now. He is open to engaging in conversations with those who have sincere questions and can be contacted at sensewithoutmind.com. So I don't think uh, any more introduction is really needed. Uh, the conversation speaks for itself. And to get too much into the bio of someone who's free of self would be ironic, to say the least. So without further ado, I happily bring you a conversation with Ishwar Sigobin. Welcome, Ishwar. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I'm, I'm excited to talk with you. I just discovered you and uh, I listened to an interview you did a while back and I was uh, 
impressed, you know, because um, in my perception, in that interview, you were speaking with the wisdom of somebody who, you know, has been in this whole awakening scene for a long, long, long time, but you haven't, you know, so your, your insights uh, were arising direct from uh, awakeness, for lack of a better word, um, because, you know, it's just, I just was uh, delighted really to, you know, to hear this um, clarity of insight um, from someone whose who's awakening is relatively recent and, and also is, uh, happened very quickly. This is unusual uh, in a way. I mean, of course, it can happen quickly for anyone, but usually people find ways to resist the process of waking up so effectively that they that they manage to drag it out <laughs> for for quite a while and your whole process happened in um a, a little less than a year i believe so i, I want to ask you about that but but first i want to go back um and ask you know, did you have any sorts of what what we might call spiritual experiences as a kid did you have any like something something different happening um back when you were a kid or did you just have a normal childhood i guess you grew up in the in the caribbean yeah <clears throat> i grew up in the caribbean we, we came to the states when i was right around nine years old um but and which yeah, island yeah. Uh, in Guyana, Guyana is in uh, South America. It's the north northern tip of South America. Okay, okay, yeah. Cool. So nothing, nothing really spectacular with childhood. Um, all the stuff over there was Guyana is more of a third world country than it is um, a first world country. But growing up there, we never knew the difference because we didn't have anything else to to kind of gauge that against. But never had any real spiritual experiences or thought anything was different when I was a, a kid growing up, even coming here and being in the States, nothing really stuck out in that way. No. Yeah. That's your question directly. Yeah, that's great. And um, when, even when you were an adult, you weren't a spiritual seeker, you weren't reading all the self-help books, anything like that, right? Nope. Nope. Never, never got into, to any of it. The only thing spiritual that we knew growing up, we were, we grew up Hindu and we would sit at the altar and pray every Sunday, but never really knew what was being said because everything that was being said was in Hindi. They had, uh, you know, pujas and stuff, but I, I really didn't know what those things were about or what was really going on in that space. So it was just kind of, we saw, we observed, but we really didn't know. It was very, surfacy uh with that stuff so and i never really got into what those things were pointing to or what they really meant interesting yeah i, I want to circle back to that but first take us through you know uh the brief version i guess of 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 what happened to you that year uh 2017 when when the awakening happened so that's <clears throat> That's a lot that happened in that short period of time. But what led up to all of it was throughout my adult life, I would say in my early 20s, I started to to really get into working and uh, getting a business going. But I, I also, I started to drink around that time. I was like my late teens, I, I would say 18, 19, and then that kind of carried on into my 20s. Um, and it, it kind of progressed as I got a little a little older when I was in my late 20s, early 30s. And what led to, to all of this was I found myself drinking. And when I would drink, it wasn't n this normal, happy person that I used to be. It just started to become, I started to become just angry. And it, it just transmuted to everything around me with my friends, with my family. And 
I had found myself, I was, I had built like this shop for, for work where I was storing all of my equipment and material. And I found myself in there instead of working, just drinking like eight o'clock in the morning. And it, mm. this kind of lifestyle kind of led to yeah. a lot of altercation between my wife and myself to the point where everything came, came to a head. And, um, I didn't know at the time, but she said that I needed to go and get help because there, there was just all of this anger, especially when I'm drinking led to a lot of destructive behaviors inside the household where it's enough to scare her. And our kids were pretty young at the time. One was only a few months old. The other one was about a year and a half old. And I'd like to say that I went to get help, but it was, she said, something needs to change because I never thought you would be this destructive, especially it could be aimed towards family and our kids. But after seeing the way that you're behaving, she's like, I had no doubt in my mind that that can, that can occur here. So the, that the next day I reached out to a treatment facility, which was in Lancaster County and told them I was, you know, I was looking to get help. I didn't know what this stuff was about. Um, but I just needed to, I needed to get help. And that's what got me into, into that facility. Um, when I was up there, when I went into that place, I had a job I had to finish. I, I didn't get to before I went into this facility. Um, and I told them, Hey, uh, instead of coming on Friday, I'll be up there on Tuesday. And they were telling me, Oh, you're, you're, you're just bullshitting me. We hear this stuff all of the time. Um, you're not serious about coming, but I really had a project to finish. So once I finished the project, it didn't stop me from going out and drinking. So I went out and I drank and got in an argument with my wife that same night. And that night I decided to, I just jumped in an Uber and I went straight to the facility from Philadelphia to up there. It was like a, at that time it was like a $182, $172 Uber ride up. And when I got there, I was still, still pretty wasted. In that, in that place, when I woke up the next day, I was in like a detox facility and there was just like this calm and I was there and it was like, well, I'm here. Let's see what this is all about. And in the facility itself is where a lot of stuff shifted. Um, one of my primary, uh, things were anger and resentment. And while I was going through that program was a 30 day program in there. One of the, the therapists was an anger management therapist and we were going through some, some of the stuff that he was saying and in what he was saying, I started to see how I was forming my own resentments. And it was, I was casting this projection of how people are supposed to behave and then having a, a mental interpretation and reaction when they don't meet those expectations and then have a physical response to the actual person. And all the while they didn't know any of this was going on. And when I saw that process, how it was happening within myself, it dawned on me that if I'm doing it, I could just, I could just stop. And when I, when I realized that it felt like a weight was just lifted off my shoulders. Like this, this thing I was carrying around all this while just kind of lifted off. And all, all that was really needed was for me to see it. And while I was in that facility, the, the only thing that I really knew about spirituality or in Hinduism was the, the Om, the symbol itself. So they had this gazebo thing outside where people used to go and smoke. And they had this giant pot where they have sand and people used to put their cigarettes out in it. So I used to take the sand up and draw out an ohm. And there was just this one part of the ohm that kind of captivated my, my attention. And it, it felt like this pressure was in the center of my forehead. And there was just, I would just look at that thing. And there was just this stillness that just came across. Everything just kind of like stopped. And that was like my primary focus in that facility. I would say those were the things that that uh, started to open this up because prior to this, my life was just work. You know, I was hanging out with my friends and stuff, but it was, you know, it was about getting money, attaining things, 
trying to get security and it didn't matter how much money I made, it was never enough. And that was my life. This place, when I got there, there was no cell phones, no emails, no work stuff. All of that just got disconnected. When that dis when that got disconnected, there was just something that was here that I didn't I didn't know how to be or operate it in that space, but I was completely open to whatever was going to come into this space because everything else that was going on, I already knew, and it all just kind of went to it just went to hell. It, it was it was pretty crazy and wild prior to that, and now I got this this space that I didn't know what it was. And nothing I could say or do in this space came from how things were before. So it was just, I was just completely open and just ready to see what all of this was about without really any expectations. That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm glad you're giving the more detailed version here. Cause this is, this is really amazing. So you you kind of started meditating on your own, like spontaneously. Nobody was teaching you, at least at first. Right, right. And and when you were focusing on the ohm, the was it the dot and the crescent part of the yes. ohm that was captivating you? Absolutely. That was that was exactly it. That's that's really cool because in traditional symbology right that that dot and that crescent correspond to the third eye and you were feeling that without even knowing that i'm getting goosebumps that you're saying that now because i i on to now i i didn't know that's what that was that's what it meant yeah totally <laughs> yeah that's amazing and uh, so, so then, did you get any any meditation instruction there, or or did it all develop on its own? So while we were there, there was uh, another therapist that introduced us to a pain meditation, um, which was sitting with your feet up, like on a you're laying on your back, your your feet is raised up, and on a chair, and you're just relaxing, kind of allowing your attention, body scanning, and then allowing whatever tensions there to kind of relax. That was the extent of meditation at the treatment facility. Um, there wasn't any other instructions from that. Everything else came after I left the, the treatment facility and I opted to stay at a recovery house in Lancaster up until that's where, where all of this stuff um, took place. All of the experiences happened at that, at that, uh, the recovery house itself. And was there some meditation instruction there at the recovery house? So <clears throat> there were three, three or four shifts that occurred there that were significant. Um, I would say the first one, everything started to become intuitive when, when I was at the recovery house. So, the the first set of things that I started to work on, we we did step uh, step work because it was a, a recovery program that we were in, and the the step work themselves are, in my opinion, they they kind of bring forward the ideas and concepts that we have that surrounding this this identity and the ego itself. So one one part of step work is um, you, you go through the defects of character. You write them down. You see what part of the character is affected, whether it's fear or whatever it is. While I was going through the step work process, something kind of kind of hit me was, well, if if there is defects of character, right? Why do I want to fix the character? And if it's a character, isn't it something made up? And when that kind of kind of dawn on me I started to see the different characters that was within me so and what I mean by that is the way that I am with my wife as being a husband was not the same way that I am when I'm with my daughters or when I'm with my mom being a son or when I'm hanging out with my friends 
they each one of these personalities or identities had different modes that they operated on. <clears throat> they had different guidelines that they follow. And when I started to see that, I started to see that they were only ideas and concepts. So Ishwar was like my formal name. Los was a name that, that when I hang out with all of my buddies, that's what they called me, you know, dad. And then, uh, is with my daughters and, and, you know, a son with my mom and stuff. So, you know, every, every character kind of played its own different role and operated within its own guidelines. So when I saw that, I was like, I'm not here to fix the character. Like each character had its own script. Right. Yep. And instead of me trying to fix the script and fix the character itself, it was like, it was like a tree and each of the characters are branches. If I cut off a branch by fixing the defects of the branch, then the branch just grows back. Why not uproot the entire tree? And that's the exact analogy that came, that kind of presented itself with me. So I went to uproot the entire tree. When I uprooted the entire tree, it, it didn't get rid of identity itself altogether. There was something still here, but it didn't have concepts to it. So what do I do now? So there, there were like subtle practices that came up. So I was listening to, I think at that time was Eckhart Tolle, the, the power of now. And there were some things that I, I was doing from that but one of the the primary things was trying to be more present and aware and one of the ways i would do that was and this is in a recovery house with like 17 other people i would walk up the stairs and as i was walking up the stairs i had my slippers on i would take one step up take my slippers off put the slippers on the step below take another step up go back step into the slippers, bring them up. So I was trying to be conscious and aware of everything that was happening in that, in that moment as it was happening intentionally. And when I got up to the top of the steps and I was in my bedroom, I was looking at my hands and it was like, I was seeing them for the first time. Like I've never seen them before. And that's when the conceptual overlay kind of alleviated itself from present experience, the, the veil, kind of lifted in that way. And the, the now, the, the here and now just opened up what seemed to be like a, a sliver in time became, you know, the ever present moment itself. The, the second shift that, that occurred in that place was, I was, this was more meditative. Um, Osho has, uh, I think it's 112 steps of Shiva. There are 112 meditations that you can, you can do. You cycle through each one. And if you feel inclined, like one is doing something for you, you stick with that one. Uh, for mine, I think it was like number five or six or something like that. Um, it, but it's when the I was one where light is shining up from the base of your body, right? Right. It, 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 it travels up. It goes, it coalesces at the top, top of your head, and then it showers down on you. And yeah. when it did that, it, it felt like a bolt of lightning shot up from the earth, through my feet, through my body, through the top of my skull. And it literally felt like, I know nothing of Shiva, but like God touched me in, in my, my brain. And I like shook. I walked into the recovery house and... My, I just kind of like shook for about 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes and everything stopped. No conception, no, no anything. I just, I was in a room looking at a wall and it seemed to me like five minutes, but one of the guys said, you've been there for like 45 minutes, just looking at the wall. And it was like, it, it felt almost like, like a reset occurred. And that just kind of like blew everything open. I mean, with that, all of the intuitions of what to do and how to cease mind and how to disengage mind from the sense perceptions and, you know, like all of those nuanced things started to, to shine through of what I needed to do 
intuitively. And then as I was listening to um, spiritual teachers at that time on YouTube channels, these were the things that they were talking about. And I was like, well, I already know what I need to do. So let me just focus on that and put those things aside. So that's, that's what I started yeah. to do. So this is exactly what in the tradition I study is called Shaktipat. This awakening that, that has an energetic component, right? Where the, like you felt the energy surging up, as you said, to the crown of your head and, and as if you've been, you know, graced by Shiva, like we don't need to, of course, reify that into some literal right. uh, idea, <laughs> but it's, but it's like that. It, and so that's Shaktipat and it has exactly the effect that, that you described, which is then an intuitive sense of how to move through this process uh, dawns in in the in the wake of that um, experience, because of course it's not about the experience per se, but the intuitive capacity that it makes available to you subsequently. Right, right. It wasn't it wasn't about to go and try to replicate the experience again, but it's right. to, to to sit in that open space and allow the intuitions to to come up of what it is that needs to be done. So. One of the things that that came very early on, I was I was driving, driving down the road, and I drive a lot for work. <clears throat> and then there was this eighteen wheeler, and behind the eighteen wheeler, it, it had a a sign on the the trailer itself. I think it said Lehigh Valley Farms or or something like that. And something popped up to say, read that right there not inside here and i was like hmm how do i do that then it something was like relax your vision into your peripheral vision and when i did that it disengaged this process of knowing or wanting to know whatever attention was focused in on so it just kind of became like scenic and then Lehigh Valley Farms isn't something that's said inside of my head. It's exactly where it's read on that truck or whatever we call it. That's exactly where it is. It's not an inside outside process. And yeah. In other words, you don't need to mirror it in a mind. You don't need to have a thought mirror of the words. You, you can even comprehend the words in a weird way, non-verbally, without having a thought mirror of it, it that, that you experience as being in your head. Is that is that kind of what you mean? Correct. So it was uh, without the inner dialogue. And as that insight matured, because one can get caught up in thinking that they need to stop thoughts, was that was the, the thing. Thoughts needed didn't need to be stopped. It was just to see this process for for what it is and how it's occurring and how convention is created through the marrying of whatever experience is through that descriptor and the inner dialogue, how we create this inner world within our minds that we, we interact with instead of seeing things for what they were. Neither one of those processes needed to be stopped. It just needed to be seen for exactly what it is. So it, it just brought about this calm because it disengaged this uh, this hold onto this process, this thing that we we kind of latch onto f for comfort, thinking that because we think we know, when the process is nothing like we we could ever imagine. It's simpler. Yeah, it's just we, it's just a we process. think we know because we attach to a mental representation of experience, and then sort of smugly rest on that when in fact <laughs> we don't know anything. Uh, Man, that was the the epitome of all of this was the, the first thing that had to be to be recognized. And for me was, you know, I know that I don't know anything whatsoever. And anything I know is or I could say that I know is made up. And it, it comes and it shifts in, in so many different ways. Uh, like when I realized it was it was all all language is made up. 
So my thinking itself is made up. It was just like subtle things like that. Not to say that, you know, these things don't have meaning, but outside of the meaning that anyone could ever place on it, there is no, there is no meaning to it. You know, and it's, it can seem as though it's contradicting, but until the experience occur and the shifts in perception starts to, to occur, then all of that makes sense. Yeah, it's like thoughts seem to have meaning because they reference other thoughts. And if you're staying in the mind world, then it all seems to have meaning, but it's all self-referential and it's, and it's not uh, touching into um, reality itself, which is not, you know, it's not any of our thoughts about it. And, and that's the amazing thing is that like every, every, most people manage to just live in this mind world and think they're living in the world when they've never even been in the world, at least not since they were a tiny little kid. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Before I forget, I just want to mention one one thing. Uh, we we don't need to go into it, but it's just really cool that because you discovered these hundred and twelve um, practices or or or, or pointers, um, and and attributed them to to Osho, and in fact, those hundred and twelve come from a, a tantric scripture, the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, that. I've studied for many, many years and have translated from the original Sanskrit myself. And uh, it's one of the most important scriptures in the lineage that, that I study and practice. And, and Osho gave a kind of popularized version of it. Um, but, but even from that, you know, sort of what I would call watered down popularized version, it, the pointer still worked for you and that's that's just a, a really cool thing to note and it's you know it's it's just another interesting connection because uh I, I just love that scripture i'll send you my translation of it um you know direct from the original sanskrit you might find it interesting even though you don't uh, uh need any of those practices at this point that's awesome I, yeah i'd like to to actually see exactly what it was because even in in this conversation it, like we're always learning and i'm learning just that it it explained the the ohm itself the way you described it and what all of that was i didn't know it, it wasn't until you just said it yeah you know sitting and focusing on and it was exactly that it was the the crescent and the dot whatever i drew out whenever i drew out the ohm that was the part of the ohm that just kind of focused i focused in on and then there was that pressure in the center of my forehead I was like, but I didn't know what any of that was, but I was going along with all of it. Yeah, but yeah. I'd, I'd be, I'd be interesting to read, uh, read the the actual translation of it. Cool. Yeah, and um, looking back on you know your experience with Hinduism, to just to touch on that for for a moment. Um, like, of course, Hinduism is a, it's a culture and it's a religion and religions have just like this huge, um, mass of r rituals and teachings and practices and ideas and thoughts and more thoughts. And of course, uh, when it comes to this actual awakening process, a lot of that is, is noise. A lot of that is, um, could could confuse someone, whatever religion it is. It's it could confuse them with sort of uh, too much detail and too many cultural elements that aren't directly relevant to the awakening process. But uh, having said that, you know, do you see that the any kind of like little glimmers of 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 truth or or of something? in that tradition you were exposed to as a young person, um, looking back on it from the awake perspective? For myself, I would say, um, I, I mean, they, they were all gateways and doorways into it because 
if any, if anything I gained from the, the entire tradition itself at that time, even kind of going through it, was the ability to recognize the Om itself. And that was the thing that was prominent in the beginning of the, the awakening process. That was the only thing I could equate to anything that would be spiritual or meditative was just that thing. So in that respect, um, yeah, it was it was supremely important to to even touch into that because even though all we knew was the surface of it, the true the depths of these things are are within the teachings themselves. Um, it's up to us when we start the process and we go through the process to to kind of get past the superficial and really get into the the depths of this because in the you know I, I don't like quote spiritual texts and all of that stuff because I don't know all of it but like the the Gita itself is there was like one sentence if you understood that sentence you didn't need to read the thing you didn't need to read the, the entire book itself yeah, right. and it's it's when you come to understand the nature of of uh, of self and identity and structures and all of this stuff once you see through that you know there isn't yeah. there isn't much further to to go through in the way of the 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 text themselves not to say that those things aren't important they are they absolutely are but all of that lies within us yeah absolutely yeah so if we if we come back to your awakening process then um after this shaktipat that happened from um that pointer uh and the then then you you started seeing or rather you you saw on an even deeper level um the constructedness of all concepts and they started um ceasing to mediate experience for you meaning to say um you started seeing the difference between reality and our thoughts about reality uh, in a, in a clear way, you, s- you saw the difference between what is and interpretation of what is, and that got clearer and clearer. I- I- am I characterizing it correctly? Yes. Yeah. There, there isn't a, an error between the, the reflected versus what, what can't be reflected. The, the means, the descriptor of what's, what's meaning to be described versus what can't be described because it, it isn't one and the same one is pointing to look, uh, instead of us believing the point, we should go and look and see what's being pointed to. So it removes the conflict between the two because the, the concept green wall or a green tree is pointing us to go look at what was being referred to as a green tree. And when we, we get to the the pointer and we're in front of the tree we relax the concept tree or green tree and then the fullness of the the experience that that could not be described is there for us and it's it's the words fail to describe what's really there when we sit with our sense perception bare and open and just the full vivid aliveness of this thing that we're calling green tree is readily available to all of us if we could relax the concept and the belief of the internal construct that we have inside of our head when I say green tree versus when it's actually in front of you. you know, yeah, so exactly. That, it's, that's the depth that it, it plays out, but it's, it's available for everyone. It's not anywhere uh, special. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Beautifully said. And, and, of course, it's not even a thing, you know, like the tree, when you're experiencing it without concept or interpretation, it's not even a thing in itself, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's, it's an expression of its total environment. So you don't, you can't separate it out that only the conceptual mind does that. Right. And so to, just to summarize, like, like thoughts, um, we could say br- that there are of two kinds. Some thoughts just reference other thoughts, and so they lead you in a in a loop of of thoughts that doesn't go anywhere. And some thoughts reference or point to actual experience, like 
your example of green tree. And those are the ones that are more useful on the spiritual path, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a thought d- directing you to sense experience or whether it's a thought prompting an inquiry, like, uh, you know, the, the thought, what, what is me? What am I, you know, what is that? Like, so the, and it's good to distinguish, I think, thoughts that point to other thoughts from thoughts that point you beyond thought. Right. Yeah. There's our, our thoughts that are pointing to direct experience. So, you know, it, we go back to the same green tree thing. If I say green tree and you have a concept inside of your mind of green tree, then, and you're looking outwards and that's nowhere to be found. That's, that's a thought referencing a thought, but if it's in front of you and in your direct experience, you can, you can actually see the process for how it's happening without really having a conflict with thought. Because if there's a green tree in front of you and a thought references that, you can quickly look and see, well, if the thought says green tree, does it add to my experience? And if it doesn't say green tree, does it take away from my experience? Does it diminish my experience? And you relax both of those and the fullness of experiences is present and aware. If you you go with the the thought referencing thought, the, the content of a thought and the story that it tells, that's generally what pulls us away. Like, oh, there's a green tree here. I don't like it. Or one like <laughs> this fell on me like 30 years ago. That's, you know, that's stories. That's, that's a yeah. content about that thought. And it's not direct experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So take us through... Um, how this sort of completed itself for you and and to clarify of course there's always more to learn and there's always more insights possible but there is also something like a completion of the awakening process which some people might characterize as the definitive falling away of separate self um and and would you characterize it that way or how would you and and how did that what was it like to to transit through that the the completion of the process? So there's two two folds to that. Um, the initial for me was uh, going through the, this process after I left the the recovery house and I came back I came back home, which is around August of that same year. Um, I wanted to get into really what's what's actually here because i don't have the the conceptual overlay anymore so that the thoughts referencing and all of that stopped so not that the thoughts stop is that i didn't engage with them on that level so whether they they're going on or they're not going on really was irrelevant uh, because i wasn't hooked into them anymore so i didn't have a way of of constructing a self in the way i'm moving about in day-to-day life but there was still something here that that knew itself so and i didn't know what that was so the only way i could go back was inside of my mind through memory and as i started to remember myself in different periods of of my life so at this time i was in my 30s it, it was like important milestones throughout my life was where the memories went to so one was 24 which was when I moved from New York to Pennsylvania. The other one, you know, I was like 17 ish transitioning from high school to adulthood. The other one was around nine ish when we came to this country. And I got to a memory when I was about four years old and the memory itself wasn't all that important. So I I was just laying on the bed and I was like, you know what? I don't know what what any of this spirituality stuff is. I don't know what anybody else is talking about. I I can't conceive this thing that's me outside of me. So we leave the external. Let's go inside. So I got to that memory and it was, I was four. And I was was like, well, if I'm four, something must be here before I'm four because, you know, I'm four years old. And my mind just kind of, I stayed there with that. I was focusing on my breath and, you know, I had that tension in the, for, the forehead, that, that space. And my mind could not conceive of a time outside of 
all of the things that it created. So the, prior to it, it can conceive. So inside of that, the, this image of myself as a four-year-old came up and it was me, this adult, looking at this four-year-old and the four-year-old, it was like my face, the, the little kid's face, which was my face at that age, turned. And as it turned, the back of it was hollow, empty. It was like a mask. And the minute that was seen, it, it felt like an, a rubber band was, was being pulled, right? And it had this tension and the rubber band just cut. And the, my entire, the entire mind just unraveled. And it went from that to cessation to, to just nothing. And it showed exactly how this thing uh, comes about. So it was, there, there's a space, when I say nothing, it isn't, there's just, it's referencing something that just can't be described. And it isn't, it isn't a conceptual thing. And then there's this sense, then a sense of, then a sense of me than the entire manifestation itself. And in the manifestation itself, it isn't unified. They're all the sense perceptions, unwoven. It was experiencing, it was experience, experiencing, experience. Not unified, not this, this one thing that's here that's experiencing all of this stuff that's going on. And it kind of coalesced back down and here, here I was again. And immediately after seeing that, it was like the need to, to do, to go and work, to achieve, to gain, to do this, to do that. All of that just, just fell away. All of that stuff just let go. The need to grasp and hold on to things. Doesn't mean that, you know, I can't plan for stuff, but there is no holding on to the outcomes of things. And it, you know, there was this very clear sense that this here and now is all that there is. There wasn't anything in the past that was creating this, and there isn't anything in the future to to really go and get after. This is all that there is, and it shifted the way I I can I conceived of time. There was no more past. There was no more future. This is it. This is all that there ever was without really making too much of, of here and now. And, you know, I saw how through the sense perception, how they're woven together and this, this sense of me arises and how to, to sit and kind of deconstruct that. So it got deconstructed on the level of mind of an internal world where I, I, it was like almost I got the boot out of that space. I got kicked out of that space. And now I'm square here. And this is where, through the sense perception, the remainder of if there's a, a sense of that's here, that it gets deconstructed. And that's back through the sense perceptions again. Yeah. And even though the the conception of time falls away that you still perceived a sequentiality in terms of there's just this no thingness and then something like a, a, a self or an idea of self arises within it and then that has a kind of gravitational attraction to certain thoughts uh, and, it, and it builds up into something like an ego uh, and then and then that's seen through. There's this sequentiality, which is mysterious because uh, there's only actually now, but still that sequentiality is, is perceived in terms of how this happens. Uh, would you say what would you say about about that if anything it it showed exactly how the the feeling that i've i got from that was this entire thing is a is a projection it's a it's something that i'm that i'm making up but it's not me that's making it up it's it's just projected outwards and i'm holding on to 
to things that really can't be held on to. Um, it can appear in that in that linear sense. That's the best way I can describe it, where it would make sense. But there's a, there's a space where none of that stuff is unified. None of the the perceptions themselves are unified, and experiences is just so. It's it's like infinite experience. And when you say they're not unified, you mean they're they're not unified by a self. Right. The the idea of of me. Because there's also no division in experience. Like if you say it's unified, then that's like a mental construct of oneness. I'm experiencing all this. But it's also true, isn't it, to say that there's no divisions at all. Right. So this is where it gets tricky to speak about it in words. Um, that's exactly it. There, There isn't anything that's divided. Um, and there isn't anything that unites with everything. So there isn't one that becomes one with everything. Right? There, the error in the perception is the idea of division. And we discover what's there once we we stop doing that. But the language itself is is just so it's dualistic in that sense, as we always have to take a reference point to try and convey an idea. So you can it can get confusing just by trying to describe it. So most of it is always pointed to, and when the experience occurs or someone dis- discovers that, you see that there is no one that discovers it. Yeah. Exactly. So this is a good point, because when people have the experience, I am one with everything, that's not the realization we're talking about. That's an experience. It's it's as valid as any other experience. But it's it's not realization if it's I am one with everything. Right. Yeah. Now, I have a question for you, though, because here's something really mysterious, right? Because the self is really just a thought. It's a, it's a persistent and, and powerful thought of me. Uh, it's a self-concept that, that then, you know, can aggregate further more specific self-concepts. And there's, there's nothing else to it. And yet, when someone is on the verge of this realization of, of, of the dissolution of separate self and, and realizing that what you are is not a self, um, there can be this immense um, struggle or resistance as if the self is fighting its own dissolution. And so the question I would pose is, how can the self be fighting its own dissolution when it isn't even a thing? It's not even an entity. It's re- it, it's just a thought. Right. That's the that's the power of the delusion itself that we we kind of place ourselves under, and it, you know it formed in a few different ways. I mean, we see it in language, and it's always when we're talking, and then the reflectiveness of thinking gives the appearance that there's a dialogue of two, a separation between the thought of me versus all the other thoughts. And that gives rise to this conflict within of this thing that's here. And it is, it is a powerful delusion in itself. It's, uh, there's not much I, I can really say about that. All I know is, is exactly what I've come to to understand by seeing through it, that there's a way to see through it. And it's not, it's not exactly what we, we think it is. So it's like the delusion is not inert. It has, it has an energy, (laughs) like the delusion resists its own dissolution. Um, and for either for a short time or a long time, uh, but then once it dissolves, it's it's seen ironically that it that it never was a thing it was only just a, like a, a profoundly deep seated misunderstanding would right. you agree with that that's exactly how it felt when the experience occurred within when it thought when it all unraveled it was exactly that it was all 
it was all my own creation, except it was it, it was a falsified thing that thought that it created all of this. And it never, it, it was never a thing to begin with, ever. Yeah. And even though what we are cannot be said in words, there are some pointers that are better, better than others. Uh, I like quiet presence. Uh, what, what pointers would you use uh, to try to describe the indescribable? <laughs> that is to say, what you and I really are. This, but not this as a, a object, thisness, um, that usually comes the, the radiant presence because it's, it's, it can be felt it's, it's here, you know, presence is, is probably the, the closest concept I think I could i could use this would point back to always here and now and the present is the presence itself is is it's here it's when we we sit and we're in that that quietness it's felt you know i think your descriptors are very very good in that that uh that regards and and the presence that's here suffuses the totality, right? There's no separation of like observer, observed, experiencer, experienced. The, the presence that's here just suffuses the totality and, and the totality of experience is its uh, expression, I guess we could say. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, things we could try to say. <laughs> <laughs> but none of it ever ever even comes close to to describe we always say you know go look and see and once it's seen then it's understood and you know even that's saying too much because that can be misinterpreted and can confuse as well too so it's it's the the totality of the the entire experience of what's occurring right now is the which is all encompassing and not excluding, you know, that's, right. that's the best, the best I can say. Yeah. There's this phrase in, in the non-dual tantric tradition that I study, um, Purna hum vimarsha, which means the awareness that the true I is all encompassing the awareness that your that your real nature what you really are is is all encompassing and completely full and excludes nothing does that resonate with you to to some degree i i know that we speak of uh the the true nature stuff i usually don't really get into um because it can give something to kind of grab onto yeah. and make some make something of. Uh, so it's always go and look and see and and find out and discover. And then we can we can have a discussion afterwards. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, tension in the in the Indian tradition between um, the, the, the Buddhist strategy and the, the strategies that we find in, in non-dual Hindu um, uh, tradition, because in Buddhism, um, which you're sort of intuitively expressing, they want to be very careful to give you nothing to grab onto. Whereas in the Hindu tradition, they'll talk about true self or true nature, and they'll try to keep pointing and saying, oh, it's, but it's not anything you can conceptualize. It's not your mind. It's not your ego. It's not, it's not, um, it's not any of that. It's, it's beyond all of that, but still there's that 
potential problem of of um, you know giving giving people something to grab onto. But on the <laughs> other side, you could make a critique of the of the Buddhist perspective because when they negate, you know, it it can form in the mind of the practitioner a concept of emptiness. Oh, emptiness is what's real, and then they're attaching to the concept of emptiness <laughs> rather than seeing. And experiencing what it's meant to 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 point towards, right? It, it's it's like it's the fullness of experience without without a view, without an attachment to to it being a specific view. And even saying that will will create a view. So it's it's experiential with this, and then we we kind of go from there. I don't get into too much of the the tradition stuff because that's not how this understanding came, you know, came to me. Some some of my friends who have gone through this, particularly my brother, he you know he went through this stuff when he was uh, younger. He got in a car accident like around eighteen, nineteen, and uh, he was in traction for like nine months. And while he was in that, is how he woke up, and he was. He's definitely from like the traditional Hindu background where, you know, you sit and meditate and, you know, he went to the ashrams and stuff. And he helped me through some of this, this process early on. And then I started to understand the depths of his understanding as he went through this. Cause even though he came from, from the Hindu background and, and sitting and meditating, he would never ever give me a definitive answer. He always said, and he didn't come from a Buddhist background. He's like, you don't need to go and sit and meditate inside of a cave. You don't need to go and sit, sit in the jungle to, to do this stuff. You could do it inside of your house, in your room. And that was it. But he would never give me any definitives of what this was, what it was like. He, he would just say, continue on. Well, that's interesting. So his awakening might have sort of planted a seed for you even though you you might not have been aware of it at the time oh yeah i mean he he was telling me about some of this stuff for for a long long time um you know look look at this you should you should get into this you should but i just never play, paid him any any mind i was just busy with you know whatever it is that was going on i'm sure he planted some seeds and that's what came through because when i was in the recovery house the only person that i really could when these things started to to come up, I reached out to him and I was asking him and he just, he's like, he would just, you know, give me the, mm -hmm. and my brother's one year older than me. And he would just, that was it. That's all he would say. He's like, yep, continue on. Keep it going. And that, that, that was it. He, that, he never said, and later on after some of the realizations occurred and hit and him and I started really talking, then he, he really started to, to open up and he talked about the, the shift Puran and how all of that stuff is related to this here. Now it wasn't about, you know, these, they're fantastic stories that's being told, but they're always relegated to the individual and their day-to-day -day life to see through this thing that they're calling themselves and really experience what's really here. Yeah. So, yeah. So another mystery uh, we could just take a moment to look at is this question of why does someone wake up with, you know, in just a few months of really giving themselves to this process and why for someone else, even though they're, they're really into it and they, they, they try hard, but it, but years and years and years go by and they're still you know, enmeshed in their concepts of spirituality and the awakening hasn't happened yet. I mean, my, my hypothesis um, is that people wake up when they're ready and that even if they think they want to on one level, on another perhaps deeper level, they don't yet you know they're not they're not quite ready they don't really want to they want more time playing their character they're they're invested in the character they want to see more of how this character turns out 
and and then at some point if they're just done with it you know then the awakening can happen that's that's sort of my my little hypothesis uh what do you think about this mysterious question there there are two aspects to it that i've encountered um one aspect is for people who've been at it for a long time and they study the spiritual texts or they've they've kind of followed like all these different teachers and teachings and and all of this stuff that they build up such a a concept of what this is supposed to look like that they're chasing their idea of what they think it's supposed to be and they're overlooking the simplicity of their own direct experience and they never want to accept that it's it can be this simple and that in itself has a a powerful draw and some people use it as a means to to polish the self to for the self the self help you know and it's exactly like you described they're not they're not really ready they may think that they want it but they're not really ready to to take that final step or to to really go at this in that way um and it requires a type of openness uh with this because this kind of i didn't have a conception of it so it snuck up on me because i didn't know what i was looking for and i didn't even know i was looking for something so when it it all it was just being that open so when this all happened it was like oh what what is what is this you know <laughs> a year a year for ago this was not even an, on my radar or even the mode of thinking or experiencing i was so mind identified and so worldly attached to the to the point where that couldn't go on anymore because it created so much misery and suffering and then you know a few months down the road it completely shifted where none of that mattered in the way that it did before where i had so much invested so much of my being invested into it that that's where it the for me my ego was drawing value from and validation from was everything that could be gained from the world and how that was being perceived and then reinforced by the world rewarding me for being that way not to say that eat any of those things were responsible for the latter but that's how it was being perceived at that time and then to shift from that to this where none of that matters does it has a a use and a function sure but do, does it have the the identity structure the latching on to it you know it's like hmm. but that snuck up on me now if i'm going intentionally looking for myself i think alan watts describes that that best it's like the the police chasing a thief into a house and then you know ringing the bell as they're they're running up looking for it you know it, it, you just know you know when you're fooling yourself you know so it's it's one of these things where you know when when surrender comes up the only thing you could do is go with it that's that that is surrender you know and that's how that's how it was with me i didn't know and i didn't know what was on the other side so let let me go and see and you know some fear comes up with that stuff but it was more intuitive for me to relax and go and find out because you know everything that i've i knew up until that point i knew and it was it was comf- comfort that came in knowledge and this this unknown aspect of this whatever this thing was going on i knew nothing about and that's when i knew that everything i know really amounts to a limitation because the unknown is is unlimited so let's go and see what that's all about and the yeah. thing that went went to go and see was a thing that wasn't yeah so you mean the 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 self engages in this inquiry and the inquiry, if it works, dissolves the self, <laughs> which initiated the process in the first place. Right. So would your advice to, to people who 
have been involved in spirituality for a long time and they've studied all the texts and everything, um, but they haven't really gone through this process. Um, would your advice to them be just start again, like just set everything aside, beginner's mind, you know nothing, look more deeply into your direct experience and don't bring all the assumptions and and stuff from your spiritual study to that yeah there's a there's a couple components with that that's that's one way but also understand that the what the traditions were teaching were methods and the method the methods are there to be used and the beliefs are to be put aside you know we get caught up in the belief aspect of this with the the traditions and the religions that we don't see the, the methods like the, the 112 methods. There were methods to look and discover some of this stuff within ourselves. So I didn't have all of the, the baggage of the beliefs behind it. I just went to try these things out and see exactly what, see what would happen. I had no expectations. But again, those were teachings and there were methods. So in... In that regards, it's not to throw out, you know, the baby with the bathwater. It's to mm-hmm. discern the the methods from your beliefs and really apply the methods. See Great. what works. Yeah, I agree. Great. And uh, one more question about reality. Would you say that when we are immersed in direct experience, meaning to say, totally non-conceptual direct experience where you can't say anything about it or even label it because the label is already a separation and interpretation but you're just immersed in direct experience like you're there with the in the forest or whatever wherever you are because you could be anywhere you could be in the inner city too and you're immersed in it without giving any credence to any interpretations or thoughts that arise would you say that in that mode that's communion with reality as such um or or would you not say that you hear that (laughs) (laughs) that's 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 all that could be said about that nice (laughs) yeah it's (sighs) perfect (laughs) yeah it's amazing how good the mind can be (laughs) at at co-opting anything you know Cause it's like that you'll be like immersing in direct experience or whatever we want to call it, just immersed in, 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 in the presence that is. And then later the mind is like, ah, oh, that's, I, I experienced direct, re- I experienced reality, you know? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it becomes a concept, it's, uh, it's it's not it and we enter into concepts it's like second nature for 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 human beings so it's becoming i would say uh, dehabituated from from that giving giving the concepts credence you know because i i teach the same thing that that you say of like it's not that you have to stop stop thoughts it's you just have to stop giving them credit stop giving them significance or reality right mm-hmm. yeah that's what that's what empowers the the mental construct to go go on and forward you know there i don't know for for me i'm I'm a very mechanical person with the type of work that we do so once once the components of how these things function were seen that was that was it there was no nothing needed to be done to change any of them you know thoughts are or okay, we can. There's some thoughts that are are pretty far out there, and I'm like, well, that's that's not my thought. And then there are thoughts about extreme happiness, and that's also not one. So, if, 
if you're going to pick and choose which one you're going to latch on to, you know you can't really pick and choose when it comes with thoughts. So it's seeing them for exactly what they are. And, you know, they're they're doing their thing. That's cool, yeah, too. <laughs> exactly. That's why that's why the positive thinking method doesn't work, because if if you attach to um, some thought, then some other thought you don't like as well will attach to you. You know, it's <laughs> it's you can't you can't have it one way. You know, it's it, there's got to be a disengagement from from thought as uh, t- from taking thought to signify reality right and then we, we don't go around imbuing them with negative and positive aspects because we have this this thing that we gravitate towards positivity only and if we engage with positive thoughts then you're engaging with all of them so if you hook into exactly. positive it's it's you only get to appreciate the positive when the, the negative arises and as the negative arises you can appreciate that as well if you appreciate both of them the same way, you can just let them be because, you know, they're cool. No judgment. <laughs> okay. So, so last question, um, how, like, how does your family see the shift, you know, that, that happened in you or, or your wife or whoever, like, can they, can they see, wow, like he, he really went through this big, shift and now he's like so chill or or whatever how would they characterize this do you think my wife is is more um at ease and and peaceful uh is how she she kind of sees it there isn't i'm not reactive like how i used to um she's seen the transformation because she was in the midst of how things were during all of the turmoil before going through this process and as we we kind of grew together, one of the the initial thing I had said to her when we were in the uh, when I was in the treatment facility, there was a therapist that we go through, and they had like family day, and she would come up, and she came up I think once or twice, and I said to her, I was like, you know, I'm here, I'm here to, I want to break the mold. I don't know what that means, but this entire thing, however it was it was going on, I just want to see see this through, and. You know, coming back and we moved back in together and she wanted to to sit with me one day because I, I would just kind of like sit and meditate and stuff and, you know, be more interactive with the girls, do things with them. And when her and I sat, she had her own experience, not to say that, you know, I caused that experience, but the space was just there for her and I and she started going through her own shifts and awakening process as well. And it it started permeating through our kids and the way that we interact with them, because we see these conditionings for what they are and how they come up and what kind of effects they have, what kind of karma they cause. So the kids themselves are, are more free in this space too. So it's like, it's like everything just self-corrected, man. <laughs> it's like all the effort that was, being put forward prior to this to to make this perfect life was deviating from the perfection that already was. The perception is the thing that shifted. The perfection has always been here. The need to try and make it this perfect life by trying to do all of this stuff, that effort was the the error in my perception with that. And that's what really shifted. And everything recalibrated on its own when this me thing, this efforting factor relaxed, you know, and they, the wife definitely sees that, but that would be a conversation for her. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's beautiful, man. And the reason I raised that is because, you know, there's people out there that have learned all the philosophy and they, and, and, and they can meditate really well and they can still their mind and they, they, they kind of think they're enlightened and and I say, well, one of the tests is, um, you know, do the do the people in your life see this profound shift, this transformation? Because it, it's possible for some people to just, you know, inhabit a concept of enlightenment 
and but in their daily life you know they they're still uh, believing thoughts and and uh, you know have fighting with their spouse or whatever and that's the thing if it's if it's real it's going to affect everything right yeah the some of the things that came into into focus was what was really 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 important which was the you know my it, it was it was never about me like things aren't ever directed at me it's always about others and with them it's you know my wife the the two girls and you know whoever is immediately around me but the majority of my time now is just that it's it's with them that's where that's where everything is there's nothing directed to to this me that wants things you know it's always about about others so and that's that in itself is a you know th there really isn't much to talk about in ways of how a self functions or or how my self function in the world because there is nothing of validity really there yeah. So the the stories don't really have a place to land. Not to say that they didn't have an importance, but um, you know, it's not even something that that I really really talk about. It's always about engaging in others with others and having discussions and conversations with them. And it's only ever about this now. <laughs> like yeah. it's 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 so strange that you know, after the shifts occurred, that's when people started reaching out from like all over the place. And these are the conversations that, that I, that I have. And this is the only thing, if there was anything to, to talk about is this. Yeah. And do you see the same awakeness shining out of everyone's eyes? Like, like for, for me, even if the person is deluded and, and confused and what we call unawake, mysteriously, the same awakeness is there, just not recognizing itself. Like the, like the same one looking out of all of these eyes. Is, is that how you experience or is it, how would you say it? Yeah, it's, everybody's already awake. It's just, they have this idea <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's trippy man it's it's like um you're watching and then you're hearing the story that's coming out saying something com completely contradictory and it's like <laughs> you're nah but you know you go through the process to to see that you know you get up to look to see that you didn't need to get up and look yeah well Beautiful. It's it's wonderful to speak with you about these things, and uh, I know uh, you you do one on one coaching. People can reach out to you, and uh, you, you do um, this coaching because um, you know that it, if there's any any help that can be rendered, it's it's often rendered most effectively in that in that one on one context. Um, I mean, I teach larger groups, but the challenge with that is you, you, you have to speak in more general terms and it's, and it really works better often if you're, if you're, uh, inflecting the teaching in a way that, that applies to, um, the, the apparent individual. Yeah, it's that's what I found to be most, most effective because as you're speaking with someone, you can kind of see exactly where, where they're at with it and speak to that in a way where it, it can dispel some things. And it's most effective like, like that, but not, you know, that's not to say the group speaking stuff isn't, isn't important as well because it, it brings awareness and attention to all of this. So both yeah. in regard to have their, their importance um for myself that's that's the the thing it's it's like a, a blade just kind of cutting right through and that one-on-one -on -one i find to be the, the most effective when it comes to that with the person itself yeah the individual 
Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for this conversation and for um, all the service that you do. I know it just comes naturally, but I can still uh, <laughs> appreciate it and, and celebrate. Uh, this is this is the only thing we can do really to to, uh, as it were, make the world a better place, even though everything's already perfect at a deeper level still there's a satisfaction in, in helping people be free of their suffering that they create for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a reward there that, that just can't be spoken about, you know, when it's, it's seen and recognized that, you know, what is there perceiving out of you is, we, we can say this similarly that's here per perceiving out of me but when when it recognizes itself it's uh you know what i mean like this is where all the words get kind of weird but it's just it's known you know yeah wonderful so i think your website is sensewithoutmind.com it is yes yeah. So uh, people can check that out. And, and, and can they request a one-on-one a, a -on -one through your website? Yes, there's a, a sessions tab that they can um, book a session or there's a contact tab that if they want to reach out, ask a question or have a conversation with, uh, they, can, they can do it that way as well. And I believe my email is on there as well. So they can send me emails too. Okay, great. So um, maybe we can have another conversation down the line or whatever, but uh, it's just wonderful to, to be aware of your, of your contribution, which I wasn't before. Uh, and thank you for taking the time for the conversation. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Remember, you can always find out more about the tradition of non-dual Shaiva Tantra at tantrailluminated.org, where, if you wish, you can become a subscriber to our online learning portal, and you'll receive access to a vast number of recordings, including a comprehensive curriculum in tantric philosophy, tantric yoga, guided meditation, and much, much more. Music for the podcast composed and recorded by Anne Leader. Find her at anneleader.com. Podcast produced by Grazia Tribulato. New episodes drop every week. And may all beings benefit.